Nuclear year reactions inside stars produce the other elements, the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen that you see around us. Uh, um, some classes of stars produce the lighter elements, some produce the heavier ones. And it seems, among other surprises, that uh, the heaviest elements, the, like gold, are produced in the collisions of two neutron stars when they merge to produce a black hole plus some debris. And so when you look at your ring or you look at the Webb telescope and say, where did that gold come from? Two merging neutron stars somewhere did that. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with Pins the Podcat and the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 150. And this episode is with John Mather, who is, among other things, recipient of the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics for his role as principal investigator for the FAR IR, aka infrared, absolute spectrophotometer on COBE, which is a satellite that observed the cosmic microwave background and helped support the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe. John's day job is as a senior astrophysicist in the Observational Cosmology Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, where he's also worked on many other very high-profile projects, including the James Webb Space Telescope. In this episode, we get deep, deep into Jonathan's career. So we discussed the Big Bang and the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, before detailing the ins and outs of the Kobe satellite, its extraordinary findings, and the work that led to winning the Nobel Prize. One thing I love about this conversation that I also loved about speaking with another Nobel laureate in physics a few episodes ago, Carl Wyman, is that while it's fun to get deep in the trenches of the foundations of physics, it's also neat to talk about the physics, the cosmology, and so on, just as it stands, and get deep into experiments, too. So you should check out John's book, The Very First Light, if you'd like to hear even more about Kobe and his work, and a link is in the description. I should add, or I will add, that likes, comments, subscribes, follows, reviews, endlessly appreciated. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with John. Before we get to physics proper, I'd love to talk a bit about your background. And just by way of introduction, last week, I spoke with another Nobel Prize winner in physics, uh, Carl Wyman here at Stanford who, for our listeners who haven't heard that episode, with his team was the first to isolate a Bose-Einstein condensate. But it wasn't until he was at MIT in undergraduate that he began to work with laser technology, which bore a connection to his Nobel work. Yet by the time you were in grade school, I read in your Nobel biography, you were already reading about optics. I think you built a tel telescope. And looking back, do you feel like there's a real substantive connection between your early interest in science and telescopes in particular and what you ended up working on and achieving throughout your career? Well, it certainly is a connection. Uh uh, started out as a kid uh, really reading about science in general and physics and math. And, uh, of course, as a child, I went to visit the Museum of Natural History in New York, and I saw the dinosaur exhibits and the volcano exhibits and the, the planetarium show and the giant meteorite, and I thought, this is really exciting. I'd want to know more about all of this. And uh, my dad was a research scientist about studying something unusual, uh, studying dairy cows. So we lived on a research farm uh, for Rutgers University in far northwestern New Jersey. So it was a very rural, very isolated place. So that's where I got interested and started. And the resources available to me were a few toys that I could get, a few lenses that I could eventually buy from Edmund Scientific uh, to make, or eventually even a mirror that I could use for making a telescope. Um, electronics, parts that you could order by mail. And, uh, and books. So that was my major resource for getting started into science. So 
uh, that's part of the origin story, the inspiration and the opportunities uh, afforded by a very quiet childhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I saw that your father developed a, a test for determining the protein content of milk, if I was correct. And it was funny, that was just one of those things where I read it and it struck me. It was like, oh, yeah, somebody had to develop that. We didn't just always have it. Yeah, uh, that's true. And a uh, long time ago, of course, people were uh, trying to get more butter from cows because that was valuable. And then people figured out, well, maybe butter isn't what we need more of right now. So how about more protein? So got to figure that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And okay, so that's good to know that it wasn't when you were in fourth grade that you already had in, had visions about being this uh, observational astrophysicist but no no that would take too much of a jump of imagination mm -hmm. uh, i'd never met an astrophysicist i knew uh i'd read a few stories about galileo and darwin and i thought that's all very cool but i don't know what they do another thing that i saw in your biography that jumped out at me is that you went to a summer school after i think it was 11th grade at Cornell, where you studied all sorts of things like quantum physics, optics, cosmology, among other subjects. But that was the time where you were first convinced that you had a future in science. And beyond learning from that experience that you had the intellect or creativity to succeed as a research scientist, and I don't think many people realize just how much creativity goes into science. Do you remember just what it was about science or about being a scientist that at such an early age, you already knew it was what you wanted to spend your life doing? Well, um, I do remember it was a really exciting subject that um, that's extremely mysterious. You know, when they tell you about relativity and quantum mechanics, you say, oh man, what a weird world we have. And um, you mean time and space are not what they seem to be. You mean uh, particles are not particles. Uh, you mean particles are waves. Uh, anyway, it's all pretty startling. And so I had some background enough to appreciate what that was. And uh, so, but that was, well, the, it's really the, easy to get interested in these things. It's a harder question of, do you think you could make it? Do you think you're, uh, you're you know, I'm a kid from a country high school. And uh, learned a lot of stuff out of books. So am I going to be uh, able to do anything interesting in the bigger world when I get there? So Cornell University Summer School was a place where I saw that I could actually learn and keep up with the kids from the big uh, science schools in New York City. So that was a pretty important uh, recognition for me. So, yeah, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... It was a, a basic curiosity, maybe about the, the exotic nature of the universe beyond what meets the eyes. And I guess sort of the, the very same thing that leads me to have conversations like this. But the, the last thing about your biography that I was curious about before we get into the physics is in, I saw that in 1974, you were, you were taking a workshop in something called reevaluation counseling and that you were often making proactive extracurricular strides in your emotional education and personal growth. And I was wondering what sorts of things like this you've done over the years and how you describe emotional education. Yeah, okay. Interesting question. Um, there, um, I grew up in a very quiet place. Um, our particular family culture was not openly affectionate. Um, you didn't get a hug, didn't get a kiss. Um, there was no hostility, uh, but it wasn't really encouraging. And so I knew uh, I sort of felt I'm pretty much of a, of a alone on my own here in this world. And um, that's not the only way to look at things. So I needed some help to understand that uh, uh, people would care really about each other and that I could feel that kind of affection for other people and people would like me and be interested in what I had to say and feel and I would be interested in what they had to say and feel. And so um, it's a kind of breaking out of a maybe nerdy background that uh, many of us share and uh, getting acquainted with uh, with people of very different sorts. So, you know, that was uh, an important step. Um, 
that particular program was uh, founded back in the 30s or 40s. And so there's a lot of history of it. And you can take classes to learn how to be a good counselor for another person. And that's what we I did. Um, took a lot of classes in that. Uh, it got to be interesting enough that uh, my sister took it on as uh, something she could teach. And so she did very well with that and uh, still quite, quite active in that community. So uh, it's a big deal. Uh, we need to be warm and friendly to our fellows. Yeah. And they will be warm and friendly to us. Uh, and sometimes people have suffered injury of one sort or another that uh, they don't react uh, the way they need to in a, in a situation and misinterpret what's going on. Into, um, anyway, that's, that's part of why I was interested. And I had no idea I was going to end up being a leader of yeah. many thousands of people. Um, I'm not the only leader of those many thousands of people, but uh, it was a way of really recognizing the brilliance and wonderfulness of the people that I work with uh, when it was no longer about me, you know? Yeah. I was going to say that this deep emotional work must have been terrific uh, non-scientific preparation for the leadership at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Yeah, um, I needed it. Uh, we have, of course, um, professional workshops for uh, NASA managers, for leaders inside NASA, but um, it's harder to learn from those, actually. Hmm. You have a lot yeah. of classroom instruction, but it doesn't really get to the deep underlying emotions. Mm -hmm. Well, you must you must be an extraordinarily introspective person and have been quite mature at a younger age to have already realized the importance of this sort of stuff for everybody. Ooh. I don't know that I was a mature, but I knew I didn't know. So that's, that's sort of a good place to be at if you're a scientist. You know, I mm -hmm. don't know. You know, uh, well, I'm a leader. Well, I don't know how to do that either. So a quite surprising event occurred, of course, after we proposed the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite in 74. Suddenly, I was the guy that people were going to count on to do something. Oh, man, I don't know how to do this. I'm 28 years old. So... Um, I needed all the help I could get. Hmm. Well, before we get to Kobe, but entering physics territory now, I'd like to start earlier than that, uh, around the time you were beginning work on your thesis, uh, because the cosmic microwave background contributions to the study of which earned you the Nobel Prize had just been discovered recently. And so I think this background is the right place for us to start. So... The postulation of the cosmic microwave background, it stems from the Big Bang Theory, which, I mean, to be more precise, is a large family of theories. And there's still a great deal of work being done on those cosmological models. But for the sake of brevity and the interest of history, how did this connection between theory and observation, I have Einstein's general relativity and Hubble's observational cosmology in mind culminate in early theories of the Big Bang? Yeah. Well, um, trying to recall what I know of that history, which is before I got there, of course, uh, in uh, early 1900s, uh, in the te 19 teens even, people were discovering that distant galaxies were going away from us at rather substantial speeds. In 1929, Edwin Hubble published a graph showing the correlation between the uh, motions of the galaxies in the distance. Uh, and there's a correlation that is more or less linear that in the sense that the farther away, the faster. And if you divide the distance by the speed, you get the apparent age of the universe. 1929 was that graph. Uh, and um, as an observational scientist, Hubble was not immediately convinced that this meant the Big Bang Theory was correct. I was never quite sure about that. As it turned out, it had been predicted twice already by uh, theorists. You know, in 1916 or so, we got Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, which told us about how gravity should work on large scales, including the whole infinite universe. So we had the equations of motion for the expanding universe, um, and Einstein tried to solve them, and he thought, well, of course, universe must surely be static. So this is a well-known uh, mistake that he made. He assumed the universe must be static. So in his equations, there was a place to put in an arbitrary constant that would enable that to be true. Uh, so that was his idea of the, the non-expanding universe. 
in 1922, um, Russian theorist Alexander Friedman uh, pre used those same equations and said, no, actually, I think it's expanding. Um, nobody much noticed at the time, um, people who should have noticed but didn't, uh, was uh, just after a war, after all. And um, Russia was poor and very heavily injured. 1929, um, I'm sorry, 1927, George Lemaitre uh, worked out those same equations and said uh, the universe should be expanding from what we called the, he called it, the primeval atom. Mm -hmm. um, so he got uh, had most of the same data that Hubble had um, and he got more or less the same understanding of the expanding universe, but he wasn't an, an observing astronomer. He was a theorist. Uh, so it took a long time for him to be recognized for his work. Um, in fact, when Einstein met him, he said, uh, your th mathematics is correct. Your th physics is abominable. Abominable. So uh, I don't know whether how Lemaitre felt about this, but then it took a little while before everybody recognized that Lemaitre was right. Yeah, now, now a lot of us are saying uh, that the, what we used to call the Hubble law of expansion of the universe is now the Hubble-Lemaitre law. Lemaitre was a, an amazing, brilliant man who uh, people mostly don't know uh, about, but we should, because he was made contributions in many areas. He was such a quiet fellow that um, he did not claim credit for his work as much as other people might have. Anyway, so we knew the universe is expanding in the sense that the galaxies are rushing apart from one another. That's 1929. Um, and then 1940s, uh, after the war was over, uh, we knew the properties of neutrons because we'd been doing an awful lot of nuclear work. And uh, now it was possible to calculate the properties of the early universe better. And Ralph Alpher and Robert Herman here in Washington uh, made those calculations and predicted that um, the early universe should be about five degrees Kelvin, uh, as we'd see it now after it's expanded. Uh, and that it should have produced about 20 or 25 percent helium uh, and the rest hydrogen. And both of those predictions turned out to be true. Um, so uh, that was their work. And so they got uh, on they got in front of the public a little bit, but nobody went to check their prediction that the cosmic heat that's left over from those early moments ought to still exist. So that was 1948. Um, and it wasn't until 1964 that uh, the data started to come in from the antenna at Homedale, New Jersey, uh, from Penzias and Wilson. And then they published theirs in 1965. And suddenly, there was a much stronger bit of evidence about the expanding universe. We'd seen the heat. There's a story about that, too. Uh, Bob Wilson, one of those measuring people, uh, an observational astronomer, said he didn't really believe that until he read about it in the New York Times. <laughs> That's funny. So uh, a lot of us experimenters are very cautious about believing our theoretical friends. And um, so anyway, uh, that's how that whole thing got going. In between, uh, there were predictions made about the abundances of the elements. Um, if uh, one guess would be, well, all of the chemical elements are produced in the Big Bang. And when you try to calculate it, though, you don't do not find that that's true. The... Uh, only the hydrogen and helium are, are left over from the Big Bang, and all the rest of them are made some other way. So that process was worked out in the 1950s. And we had to, we're still working on it because uh, many details matter, but uh, nuclear year reactions inside stars produce the other elements, the carbon, oxygen, nitrogen that you see around us. Uh, um, some classes of stars produce the lighter elements, some produce the heavier ones. And it seems, among other surprises, that uh, the heaviest elements, the, like gold, are produced in the collisions of two neutron stars when they merge to produce a black hole plus some debris. And so when you look at your ring or you look at the Webb telescope and say, where did that gold come from? Two merging neutron stars somewhere did that. That's a pretty amazing story. Definitely. Um, I think, well, a couple of things. One, I think it's important to keep in mind going forward that the conception of a, a static universe, you mentioned Einstein's conception of the static universe, so one that wasn't growing or even deflating was the primary alternative to the Big Bang Theory. And that's going to become 
more important as we discuss Kobe's results. But I have another question. You raised an issue. I've I've spoken to a great number of astrophysicists on the show so far, and I've gotten the sense from speaking to them that there are roughly four categories of astrophysicists. And I'm wondering if you might think there should be even more fine-grained distinctions. But there's the instrument builders. They're the observers. I know <clears throat> at one point, Richard Feynman was your hero. You wanted to be a theoretician. And then <clears throat> there are, <clears throat> excuse me, laboratory experimentalists, people who come up with the spectra that you use in your research. I'm wondering, one, if you classify yourself as an instrument builder and an observer. But what I heard you say that made me think that there should be another category is not just laboratory experimentalists, but uh, spatial experimentalists. Sort of. Okay, well, um, several questions there. One, yes. one way I describe myself is I'm a theoretical instrument builder. Okay. Which means I understand and imagine what instrument it would take to do something, to observe something, and then I've ended up working with large teams of people to make that happen. So I'm not that great with a screwdriver. So uh, there are stories about failures of my past <laughs> experiments. So, um, but... Um, I've been very. I've been given the job, basically, of working with teams to say, "Well, what is it that we need to build, and let's build it." Uh, anyway, that's what I like to do: is to sort of reach out in imagination. If you could build this, you could measure that. And so, what do you want to think about? Some of the problems have been in my mind since childhood. Um, as a kid, I knew uh, quite early on that uh, bigger telescope did not give you a sharper image because of the turbulence of the atmosphere. So um, I, I was aware of the work that was possible on adaptive optics. And while I was a graduate student in Berkeley, uh, people were just beginning to invent it. And so I was aware of that then, then it became classified. Uh, and then it came back again into the public knowledge when other people invented it. Now I'm really interested in pursuing it. So that's one of the great opportunities that we now have uh, for telescopes on the ground. Hmm. And... Maybe now I think it would be a good time to introduce the concept of the electromagnetic spectrum as it relates to astronomical observations and sort of which sorts of bodies emit which sorts of radiation to what degrees. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Well, that's a wide open category too. Uh, maybe some stories to tell. Um, maybe it's useful to tell our listeners about how was recognized that light is electromagnetic radiation. So back in the 18, late 1800s, uh, we were beginning to get the equations of electromagnetism. And we knew that a, a, an electric field changing could produce a magnetic field. And we knew that a magnetic field changing could produce an electric field. And so we had those equations, uh, differential equations that were written out. Now, a few people could understand them at the time. And there was a remarkable surprise in those equations because there was a solution to the equations that said uh, something can propagate as a wave, electromagnetic wave propagating at a certain speed, which you can calculate from the constants of, uh, elect of um, how much uh, particles attract each other magnetically or, elec or electrically. So golly gee, this it immediately jumped out that uh, when we had those equations, then light waves have the same speed as what's predicted in there. So maybe they are electromagnetic magnetic waves. So like late 1800s, I forget the exact date. And then that came around again to be really important to Einstein because uh, when he looked at that and he saw, well, actually, you can measure the speed of light from um, and calculate the speed of light in a laboratory uh, without having to move. And then when you imagine, what if I made a measurement in a moving train? Uh, would I get the same answer if I had uh, windows closed so I didn't know I was moving? The answer would be yes. Well, what if you get the same answer that way? Which led him to relativity. So big jump in concept. And from there we said, oh, well, then space and time aren't even absolute. So what a huge shock that we got in just a few decades going from discovering that light's an electromagnetic wave to space and time aren't what we thought. Whoa. Anyway, so 
Um, then uh, we come back to say, oh, well, what about what kinds of waves do we have? And so the electromagnetic waves basically are all the same, except the only difference is how long are the waves? What's the difference between the peaks? And so the waves you can see with your eye, there are about uh, 2 million of them per meter. So really tiny. You can't see the wavelength yourself. Uh, the waves that we pick up from the cosmos, from the early universe, they're about a millimeter long. Uh, the waves you pick up with your radio are about a meter long or a few meters long. So that's on the longer side. Then on the shorter side, we get to um, X-rays and gamma rays, which are all the same phenomenon, just uh, differing in wavelength. So that's a quick rundown on electromagnetic waves for our listeners. And um, then we can go on to the mysteries that they tell us about. Yeah, sure. Well, first, I, I think, again, it's just worth noting that just about everything we've discussed relating to observation so far is dependent upon these features of electromagnetic waves. So that the distance between the peaks is longer for the more distant galaxies, the redshift, is what allowed Hubble to conclude that they're speeding away from us more quickly than the nearer galaxies. Mm -hmm. And one last question about the the history is I you already mentioned Penzias and Wilson d discovering the cosmic microwave background but as I recall there, it's it was very serendipitous it was a funny story from when they were at Bell Labs do you remember just how this well, unfolded Yeah I wasn't there at the time but the story has been told many times that there was a group of people at Princeton who were looking intentionally for this radiation and they were building their equipment. And uh, then there was a traveling astronomer named Bernie Burke uh, who knew both groups. So he knew about the work at Princeton and then he went to visit his friends at Bell Labs. And they said, you know, I see that you've found something with your equipment here at Bell Labs. This is what it could be. You should talk to those people over at Princeton. So they did. So the upshot was, uh, the, group, the leader of the group at Princeton had to announce to his buddies, boys, we've been scooped. And, the, and eventually they both published their results in the same issue of the Astrophysical Journal. Yeah. But the people who had discovered it already um, the first time uh, were the ones who got the Nobel Prize for it. And they did good work. They should. <laughs> you mentioned, now moving on a little bit to your to your work, you mentioned that there have been some stories about your expertise in ideas and theory with instrument building, but your lack thereof with screwdrivers. And I'd like to turn back to your thesis project, which, though I guess ultimately unsuccessful, was, I think, a crucial part of your trajectory to Kobe. And can you describe the, the project and why it didn't fly? <laughs> Yeah, actually, ultimately, it was successful. Right. Uh, just right, not right. with my, my, it wasn't me that fixed it. Mm -hmm. So, um, what we were doing was uh, conceived by my thesis advisor, Paul Richards. And he said, if we could get a piece of equipment above most of the Earth's atmosphere, we would be able to measure the spectrum of this cosmic microwave radiation much better. And the reason you need to do that is the Earth's atmosphere emits its own radiation and blocks what's coming in. So, okay, you need to get up really, really high, about 140,000 feet up. Uh, and how you do that? Well, you hang your payload under a gigantic balloon that's uh, 300 feet in diameter. So it's that's an immense massive. project to do this and uh, rather tricky. So anyway, this is the idea. So we built our apparatus in the labs in Berkeley. Uh, with was me and three and two other graduate students and some engineering teams and my thesis advisor and we had it all ready to go and we said okay well it's time to go um so we've gotten about as far as we can with things that we can test here in berkeley and that was true uh almost as far as we could have gotten so we drove the equipment down to texas and there's a town of palestine texas where you launch balloons and so we did it. Uh, we launched it there. Um, first thing that went wrong was the antenna that I had soldered myself onto the bottom of the payload fell off. 
but it fell off on the launch pad. So somebody went out and stuck it back on, thank goodness. Then we launched the payload and it went up and it failed to function properly. When we got it back, we found out there were three different reasons for that. Two of which we might have found if we'd tested the apparatus in a laboratory in Berkeley at a very low temperature. Because it's pretty darn cold up there. It's about minus 70 F. And it's cold enough to freeze electronics, freeze uh, insulation so it'll become brittle. Um, and, we, and so there were two different parts of the apparatus that failed because they were cold. And there was a third part that failed for a reason we never would have guessed, uh, which is water got into a motor in Palestine, Texas. The humidity at sunset is 100%. And if your apparatus is a little bit below room temperature or the temperature around, water will go in. So our motor got rust, our motor got wet and it rusted. Oh man, so that just it, it wouldn't turn at all when we got it back. So three reasons why it didn't work. So my lab partner, David Woody, uh, built a, a big ice chest of styrofoam boards and dry ice, and he got the thing cold enough. So he found all the reasons why it would fail, and he fixed them. So on the second flight, it worked perfectly. So anyway, um, we did indeed measure the spectrum of the cosmic background radiation, and it pretty darn close to the prediction of the expanding universe story, which is uh, called a black body spectrum. Uh, black body is the sort of ideal radiator. Uh, it absorbs everything that falls on it, doesn't reflect anything, which means that it emits also at the maximum possible efficiency. So there's only one number to know about such an object, which is its temperature. So it was well predicted that that your early universe should look like that. So we said, yes, it does, but not exactly, not exactly quite. So that makes it an interesting thing. You have to follow this up. So that was the beginning of my work on the cosmic background radiation. But by the time of the second flight, I had already got a job at NASA in New York City. At um, Columbia. At Columbia University is where it's located. So that's how it led on to the rest of my career. Uh, I, I, I went to Columbia to a NASA lab there, and my hope was to escape the subject of cosmic background radiation. This is just too hard for a student. Uh, but uh, so I was going to become a radio astronomer and I built apparatuses to take to a telescope and measure radio waves um, to do study molecule molecules around other stars. So that was kind of fun. Um, that's also difficult. Um, but then uh, summer of that year of 74, um, NASA put out a call for proposals, an announcement of opportunity that said, OK, uh, we landed on the moon five years ago. Um, Okay, tell me what you want to do as scientists now. And so NASA uh, was expecting a handful of proposals, and they got over 150 of them, including our team. Uh, we proposed to build the COBE, this Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, uh, to measure the spectrum of the Big Bang radiation, how bright is it at each different wavelength, uh, to look for whether it has spots, whether it's equal brightness in all directions, and to look for uh, diffuse infrared background light, which comes from, we hoped, uh, from the first generations of galaxies. So we proposed that, and uh, we didn't get to build exactly that. But um, you know, after a little while, NASA said, that's interesting, and uh, here's a little bit of money to work on it. So that's how we got started on the, on the COBE satellite. Hmm. Well, going back to this launch in Texas, Dealing <clears throat> with the cold, of course, became, I mean, a, a huge problem with engineering that you had to deal with in your later work, <laughs> sending things into space where it's much colder than the atmosphere. But this raises a, a bigger question. And I don't think people realize when they think of astrophysics, how much of the work involves engineering. And you wrote of an episode during your PhD thesis, and I have the, I pulled up the quote over here. I liked it. Um, this was the beginning of a baptism by fire in the art of building instruments that would work in remote and hostile locations. It was a time to learn something of almost every area of engineering, from mechanical to optical to cryogenics to electronics. And... <laughs> Without getting into the details yet, they'll they'll come up. But I'm curious about your enjoyment 
of your work. Are you, do you see yourself as in a sense, just as interested in making the discoveries as you are in developing the tools or is developing the tools uh, a chore that just pays off when you make the discovery? Oh, well, I sort of grew up with the, the faith that uh, what a physicist does is to build something to measure something. That was my picture of the old time physicist. And I, that's sort of still how I look at things. Nowadays, um, it's still how I look at things. Uh, the thing that interests me the most is what to build to discover something. So I, I built my telescope in high school and building it was more fun than using it because actually it's a little telescope. There's not that much you can see with it. Um, when we, of course, uh, built the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, um, it was such a big crowd that it took 100 people to analyze the data. <clears throat> so it's not quite so hands-on that way. So the way, of course, you do these things is you have teams, and I would uh, go in every day to meet with several, several different teams, and well, what have we found out today? What are we going to try to do now? How are we going to calculate the answer that we're after? And so that's a it's a it's not quite the same uh, process of pleasure as discovering something yourself when you're just solving a crossword puzzle or very individual it's a very much of a group process so um but it's all discovery you know there it's discovering a solution to something that nobody ever even thought about before some of them are engineering challenges some of are some of them are science challenges and um, where I think I really enjoy uh, challenges are where um, the sort of boundary between science and engineering, where nobody knows how to calculate this. Nobody's ever been there before. There is no engineering tool available to ask. So we need to have at least a, an early decision about what's worth working on and what could be a possible design that might work. That's very neat. It's neat that... I, ha I, I hadn't really thought about it this way, but that an inventor or an engineer is an explorer in a similar way to an observer. They're, they're discovering different things. One is more maybe in conceptual space than discovering something about reality, but there's, uh, you can have eureka moments for both, both uh, fields. If you're, if, as an example, a user of an observatory like the Webb Telescope, um, you don't just point your telescope at a random place and hope for the best. You have uh, eons of discussion with your friends about what's the best place to look? What's the most important question to answer? Uh, could this equipment answer that question? Uh, why? And you, you work at this for months before you can say, I know what I want to do because you're now competing with hundreds of other scientists, maybe thousands of other scientists for time on a precious observatory. So um, there's a creativity of process that applies just to deciding what to look for, which is pretty exciting too. I'm not close enough to do it. You know, the things people study these days uh, didn't even exist. No one knew about them when I was in school. So the kids coming through school know far more about those things than I could possibly catch up with. What do you mean? Well, hopefully we'll have time to talk a bit about the web since you played a major role there as well. But during that, I, I, was it a job or a postdoc at Columbia? It was it was one of the two. Uh, Actually, it was really a NASA job. Okay. So it happened to be located at Columbia University, but it was a NASA job. Hmm. But I think it occurred to you there that the experiment that you initially had intended to be flown up by this balloon would work better in space. And I was wondering if there was a reason you hadn't tried this earlier, or was there just not the funding necessary at the time? I think you all, you already might've mentioned atmospheric perturbations that might have played a role or was sending satellites or other man-made objects into space, just much more difficult at the time. My goodness. Well, actually, even before I got to NASA, I knew that that was a thing that, would work better. Okay. And even as a graduate student, it's obvious uh, that the atmosphere is our big problem. Can't you get above it? Uh, there was even a, a NASA review committee that came around to see what we were doing while I was a graduate student. We explained it to them. And if, if I remember right, somebody on the committee said, well, why aren't you preparing this for space? 
my thought was, well, that's way too hard for me. I'm only a kid. Uh, I can't do that. So, so on the other hand, uh, a year later or so, I was at NASA laboratory and had advisors who knew what to do. So I said, well, we didn't, I, we, we should try this in space. And they said, we will call our friends. We know who to do this with. And they, and it worked. Hmm. And am I right that you've, you've been at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt ever since? Yep. Um, and actually, the lab in New York is a part of our laboratory here. It's all part of Goddard Space Flight Center. So actually, I've been at NASA since 1974. So next year will be my 50th year. Oh, great. How about that? Well, uh, an early congratulations on that. But... Before we turn to the to Kobe itself and the instruments, the the mission, you already mentioned this process of there being various I don't know proposals and then sort of a battle within NASA. So your team put these get these proposals together to see who would get funding, and there were a couple of steps here. And I was surprised because I don't really know how NASA works. Is that still how it operates with in-house teams working on different projects that compete for funding? Yeah, although it's more general. It's not just in-house teams. Um, if you're a professor somewhere and you have an idea, uh, you assemble a team, uh, you write a proposal. Uh, nowadays, because we've been doing this a long time, uh, NASA has a process which is pretty well organized. And uh, every now and then we say, now we're running another competition. You all get ready to propose. And we set the rules, which are well documented. And it, it's all much more uh, organized than it was when it was done the first time. Uh, but yes, it's the routine thing to do. Um, it's one of the sources of creativity and success for NASA that um, we solicit the best ideas and we get a lot of them. And when you've chosen a handful of the very best, then it almost always is, is exciting. Mm -hmm. So that's one of our secrets of success is that uh, competition. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a thing we all complain about because most of us lose most of the time. Yeah. And I saw that beyond, I guess, losing most of the time when you were, even after you had approval for Kobe and you were working on it, you would still occasionally lose your really top talent to help out with Hubble and other emergencies. So it's, it's all very oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, there's a certain degree of chaos, which is creative one hopes. Hmm. So now thank you for humoring all of this backstory that I've been asking about. So let's talk about Kobe itself. Um, what was the design, I mean, roughly of the satellite? And we can hold off on the observational components, but what were the engineering feats and problems you had to overcome just with building this thing and getting it up there? Okay. Um, well, there were two versions, by the way, of the Kobe satellite. One was built to be launched by the space shuttle to go up from California. And then we had to redo it because after the Challenger blew up, yeah, we realized that was never going to happen. And maybe before we go on, though, I as a Challenger happened w way before my well before my time, so I didn't really know anything about it. I look I looked it up as I was preparing for our interview. I watched the video, even knowing that it happened thirty something years ago. It, my heart was pumping watching this video. It was pretty terrifying. Why did this explosion of a space shuttle in Florida have an impact on your launching up a satellite on the other side of the country? Okay, well, number one, it demonstrated that we did not know how to launch the shuttle safely. Uh, number two, we lost one. Um, and, and actually, number three, never we didn't have a constituency of other people that wanted to be launching shuttles on the West Coast. So the combination of all of those three uh, said, well, we're just not doing that. So, uh, by the way, it's the, uh, the disaster. We've lost, we lost two space shuttles, one at launch and one in trying to land. Um, both of them are used in our annual NASA training about don't do that anymore. Um, understand risk understand uh, things that are dangerous, 
and be alert to things that you should be alert to. I guess this is taking us sort of a bit far afield, but which is the one that we lost? The, the, the name Columbia sounds right to me. Yeah, the Challenger is the first one. Yeah. And that was launched lost during launch. Yeah. Then this, this Columbia was the second one that we lost, and it was lost when we tried to land because the wings had been damaged during the launch. Ah. Okay. So we had two major disasters, and both of them showed that we did not know how really to uh, have a properly reliable process for things that were really dangerous. Were there casualties with the Columbia? Because I saw that after the Challenger, oh, there were, okay, because I saw that they added ejectable seats and then pressurized suits, but I guess that didn't help in this instance. So um, the, if your launch goes badly, then maybe you can eject before you're all the way into space. So that uh, protected indeed against further launch disasters, and we did not have any of those. Um, coming back on damaged wings, that wasn't going to help. Okay, I see. Okay, so I'm, I'm I'm sorry for for derailing your train of thought, but I had asked about the the build of the satellite. You explained that the first version was changed after the Challenger. So then we can talk about the second version and how things had to change. Yeah. So um, the main difference was um, the space shuttle had a completely different orbit that it could reach and and couldn't go as high. So that meant we had uh, 5,000 pounds of extra stuff for the space shuttle version that we didn't need anymore for the uh, Kobe that would go up on a reusable, sorry, an expendable Delta rocket. So we've shed 5,000 pounds, but we had to go to a different place and fit a different volume. So um, the big change was find a way to fit inside this much smaller rocket uh, and go where you wanted to go directly. So we were very lucky in that choice because um, the most difficult part of the instrumentation did not change at all. That was the part inside the helium cryostat. Uh, the instruments that were around the outside of the cryostat um, had to be made just a tiny bit smaller. And so they were lucky about that. Then the, what we call the spacecraft bus, all the mechanical structure and all the other parts, they had to be redone completely. But that's sort of normal engineering work, and we knew how to do that part. Hmm. I'm, I'm talking to Alan Stern in a week or so, and he's leading another NASA mission. But one of the things that I find so cool about this conversation that we've been having is it's an opportunity to really talk about the engineering side of astrophysics, which I, I haven't had an opportunity to do before. So I hope you'll permit me some more detailed questions here about the satellite. And one, I saw that one of the major engineering problems or features that you had to work into the satellite was enabling it to move, orient itself in the emptiness of space. And I think I saw that there was a deployable mast, which is very Star Wars-y, if, if I'm correct about that. Well, we do have uh, two deployable things on that satellite. One is the little arm that holds the antenna, uh -huh. and it pushes down a little bit, and then there's actually a... a a vent for the helium gas is is there too to make sure that puts puts the uh, is unwanted thrust. We wanted to make sure the unwanted thrust goes in the right direction, hmm. and um, and the uh, solar panels had to unfold, and there was also an unfolding uh, conical shield that protects the instrument package from the sun and the earth. So all those were fairly ordinary but possible failure modes. Uh, so. A lot, of it, a lot of attention goes into making those things absolutely fail-proof. Hmm. So it's the, the helium gas thruster that, or the gas thruster that is what enables it to move around and shift position. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, the helium gas comes from the helium cryostat. Oh, okay. Okay. Which is, a, that's what keeps the, two of the instruments cold. Uh, and uh, we actually did not want the thrust that came from it to escape. Uh, so we had to make sure it did not try to turn the t observatory over. Okay. Make sure that the force points in the right direction. 
Then what was the apparatus that would allow it to move? Uh, I mean, beyond its natural. Yeah. Orbit. So we had to do something quite creative and unusual. It was one of the first big engineering problems that we had to solve. We needed to make sure that the observatory would always point away from the Earth as the observatory or orbited around the Earth. So the and we had to make it spin around the symmetry axis. So it would not only look away from the Earth, but it would be spinning. So the, I think we're the first people that ever had to do that. So how do you do that? Well, um, if your gigantic spacecraft is rotating, even fairly slowly, it's got a lot of angular momentum. And so it's a big top, a big gyro. You can't just turn it over. So what you have to do is have a competing gyro that spins exactly the same amount, but pointing in the opposite direction. So the total angular momentum is exactly zero. And then this thing can point in any direction while it's spinning because something else is counter-rotating. So that was number one invention we had to have. And then we had to have uh, ways to control that rotation um, without th little thrusters. So how do you do that? Well, we, the Earth's magnetic field is big enough at that altitude that you can have a magnet. Um, you have a, a, a big iron rod, wrap a, a coil around it, send current through it, and you've got a magnet that you can control. So we use that to control the spin of the rotation uh, of this remarkable thing. And then there's a whole lot of very complicated math behind it to know exactly how to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm struck, though. Why is the spin so important? Because intuitively, though, obviously, you can adjust for spin after the data is collected. It, sound, it seems like this would give you a blurred image, like if you imagine trying to take a picture with a spinning camera. Yeah, but we did it on purpose for a very important reason. Mm. We needed to make maps of those spots on the sky, of the microwave spots. And those microwave spots are extremely, extremely faint, like a part in 100,000 mm -hmm. of, of a very, very low temperature already. So we're looking for micro degrees Kelvin, changes right. of temperature. So how do you do that? Well, you can't do, a, do it. You have to actually have two antennas pointing in different directions. And then you compare them. So is that spot on the sky brighter than that spot on the sky over there? And you can try to com compute hundreds of millions of measurements, and then you stuff them into a, a computer program called the least squares fitting program, and it makes a map that fits all those hundreds of millions of measurements as well as possible. So, But that now means we have to spin the spacecraft to get all the combinations of two places on the sky 60 degrees apart. So that was that job. And that's why the whole observatory had to spin. Mm. I see. And we will, in a few minutes, when we talk about the results, hopefully get to uh, isotropy and anisotropy and why all of this is very important. I just still want to talk a bit about more about the engineering details. But you mentioned this shield to protect it from the sun and earth. And this, I'm guessing, is not to prevent damaging sort of radiation, but to prevent noise in the data. Is that? Yeah, well, it's two parts. So one is just sunshine is hot. So we okay. wanted the equipment to stay cool. Um, and one is the uh, sun and the earth are sources of microwave radiation that could interfere with uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave radiation. So we need to block both of them. Hmm. And then two, two last things here. Uh, the the first one that comes to mind is there is a lot of debris in space. I mean, I don't know if it's significantly more so now than then, but were there any ways of repairing Kobe if anything should happen to it, like a stray rock? No, uh, there was no way to, re to, to repair it. Um, and we did not need to repair it um, as it turned out. Although we did have a failure right away after about three or four days, uh, one of the gyros failed. So we used gyros to tell how, how fast are we spinning. Uh, but we understood even when they designed it that they were not perfectly reliable and we'd better be ready. Mm -hmm. So the design accommodated a failure, failed gyro. And so it was actually not a problem. It was just scary. Yeah, well, speaking of scary, after that movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock, where I think some stray space debris destroys some spacecraft that she's on. Uh, at least in the zeitgeist, we have this idea that there are rocks all over the place zooming about 
in our orbit. Is that something that you would lose sleep over or is it so low probability you just didn't expect that this would happen? No, actually, we knew there was a probability, but there wasn't anything you could do about it. And the probability is low. Mm -hmm. So um, we know that problem is getting worse and people are working hard on trying to bring down the debris before it hurts anything. Mm Mm-hmm. There are at least two uh, satellites where, where there were accidental collisions, and there were at least two satellites that were destroyed intentionally, producing a lot more debris. Mm. So we know there's a problem there, but anyway, so far, astronomy has mostly avoided it. Mm-hmm. The idea of these rocks, though, I mean, they're not moving at terrestrial speeds. They're going at hundreds or thousands of miles uh, an hour, maybe even a minute, and that's that's terrifying. Ten, tens of mi- of miles per second. Yeah, <laughs> that's fast. That, that really hurts scary. if they hit you. Yeah, yeah. But exactly. There are also, by the way, natural rocks in space. And when I say a natural rock, I mean a grain of sand, uh, something that that you can barely feel because it's a thousandth of an inch in diameter, is common in interstellar space, and the, and they're always falling on the Earth. And if they hit you, you would feel it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it would go right through you, maybe. No, it wouldn't, but it would definitely hurt. Okay. It could go through your spacesuit hole and make a hole. Mm. That's not good. <laughs> not, but, no. Uh, so, there are, I, I briefly mentioned this a little, a, f- a few minutes ago, but there are, there are plenty of very successful ground-based telescopes. Why was COBE essentially the, a space-borne telescope? Because there are microwave detectors on Earth, too. Yeah. The, there were two reasons. One is that uh, you basically couldn't possibly make the measurements from the ground at all um, because of the interference of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and we'd already gotten about as far as we could with measurements on the ground. So we knew you couldn't do it from the ground. And then we knew it would be much better if you could get a complete map of the entire sky as compared just to just a little piece. So for both of those, you need a space mission. And okay, now to talk about the observational components, you mentioned some of the ones that were on the on its predecessor that came, I think, with or after your postdoc. But there are three. I'll read them out loud because I I definitely couldn't have remembered them. There were the the far infrared absolute spectrophotometer. The, a word I've never said out loud before, the differential microwave radiometer and the diffuse infrared background experiment. So what did these three things account for in the, the COBE? Yeah, so the first one was to measure the spectrum of the cosmic microwave radiation, and that was the one that was a direct outgrowth of my thesis project. So um, it uh, operated by sensing the radiation with a tiny thermometer, uh, and before the radiation got to the thermometer, we sent it through a thing called an interferometer. So we changed the amount uh, of, of heat arriving at the thermometer in a known way so we could tell what was the wavelength of the light that was coming in. So that was, a, it's called a Michelson interferometer. So that was this a secret optical thing that had been developed by people in Britain. And then we uh, used a version of it for my thesis project. Then we said, well, we'll, new, we'll just improve it for the satellite. Uh, its special addition was something you could never have done on the ground or even on a balloon, which was to have a thing we call a black body, a big chunk of plastic that would emit radiation exactly the way we say the Big Bang radiation should be. So um, when you put this piece of plastic in the antenna and you get the same answer that you had when you were looking at the sky, you immediately know you've proven that the, the uh, prediction is, is is right. So it only took a few weeks before we were able to make that announcement. So so that's how that one works. Uh, the second one was to, it's called the differential microwave radiometer. And that's the one with the two, with the pairs of antennas that point in different directions, 60 degrees apart, and you collect all the combinations. And then you make a map. So it's differential because it's comparing two antennas. And, uh, and it operated at three different frequencies, uh, 31, 53, and 90 gigahertz about. And uh, that's where the uh, equipment worked well enough and the cosmic background is bright enough so we could make a map. And the third one was to look for the light of the first galaxies. Uh, And it had a small telescope, about 8-inch diameter, 
um, added uh, very coarse resolution because we were just trying to collect the total brightness of the sky. Um, but then we had to study the, the, the radiation of everything. Everything radiates at infrared wavelengths. <coughs> There's stars that radiate. You know where they are. There's interplanetary dust, which we call the zodiacal light. And it's pretty bright. And then there's the inter, inter, interstellar light uh, coming from interstellar dust. And then a whole lot of messy stuff. But the am, ambition was, after you take account of all of those things that are nearby, is there anything left that could come from the most distant galaxies? And the answer was, yes, there is. The universe is about twice as bright as people thought it would be. We still don't really know why. Hmm. Well, the last component of the Kobe that I wanted to ask about, and it's already come up when we were talking about this unwanted helium thrust, is the helium cryostat. And I have the sense that this was quite innovative and something that was prototyped. Maybe you mentioned this or developed for an earlier project of yours. So what was this piece of equipment and why was it so vital for the instruments that that we just discussed. Okay, well, it's called a cryostat. And cryo means cold in Greek. So we want to keep something very cold. In this case, we need to have it at about 1.4 degrees Kelvin, very close to absolute zero. And the way we do it is we have liquid helium in a big tank. Now, liquid helium evaporates, uh, boils away, basically, and uh, carries away the heat that's getting in uh, as, as a cold vapor. So... Uh, the technology behind it is uh, a big metal uh, reservoir of helium, um, and that's protected by many, many, many layers of what we call super insulation. When you buy a space blanket down at the museum, as you get this, uh, layers of thin metallized plastic. We have a, a lot of those in between the uh, tank of helium and the outer shell. And so that's a helium cryostat to keep something very cold in space. And there's a, a totally astonishing phenomenon that we use to keep the helium in and let it out gradually because uh, at the temperature we're interested in, helium is a thing called a superfluid, which means it's a quantum mechanical liquid and um, it has zero viscosity. It will flow through little tiny holes. And uh, so how are you going to keep it in? So somebody at Stanford University in the 60s invented a porous plug. So it's like an osmosis thing where you remember when in high school you might have tried sugar water in a carrot? No, and, I never did that. And you didn't try that. Anyway, uh, you can pump this liquid helium by temperature differences. So you can keep the helium in the tank if it's warmer in the tank than on the outside. So that's the method of the helium porous plug. And so it was invented before us. It was perfected for the infrared astronomical satellite, the IRAS, that was built a few years before us and you know, built, by the way, at Ball Aerospace Corporation in Boulder, Colorado. So a, a, a major, major technology development, though we wouldn't have the astronomy program of today without that. Hmm. Do you think there's anything about Kobe, the satellite, that's really important that we haven't discussed yet. I know that there were many challenges that it faced, the Challenger being one of them, but I wanted to make sure that we covered all of the the notable engineering aspects. So I'm sure that... Uh, yeah, well, there's one one important thing to mention, which is everything's different when people's things are cold. Metal isn't even the same. Mm -hmm. Some kinds of metal just disintegrate because they change their crystal structure when they get cold. And plastics become brittle. Now, lubricants don't lubricate. Oil becomes solid. So um, engineering something to run at a low temperature like that is a big pain in the neck the first time. Um, and then to actually succeed, you have to test everything more than once. So it's turned out to be immensely difficult to do. On the other hand, we learned how to do it. And when we had done it, we said, now we're very much more brave. And a few years later, we got a chance to build the the web telescope, and we needed all of that expertise that we now had because we had just solved some terribly difficult problems. So it's no longer the first time 
when somebody says we need a cold telescope. Yeah, this notion that things are very different when they're cold is very important. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was the root of the problem with the Challenger was that these little devices called O-rings became rigid when they shouldn't have been because of the temperature that morning. And this is what resulted in uh, a leak and the subsequent explosion. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there was That was the engineering design. And then there was the human design, which said, we're going to forget that. We're not going to believe the engineers. We're going to launch anyway. Mm -hmm. Famous last words, ignore the engineers. Yeah, just about. <laughs> but okay, so before we turn to the findings, there are a few key, key terms that I think we ought to lay out. You already handled black body radiation, which was an important one. But the other two are, and I already mentioned them, isotropy and anisotropy, which, as one might guess, are related. So what are these two concepts and how do they relate to the CMB? Yeah, yeah. So isotropic uh, comes from Greek, of course. Iso meaning the same and tropic, I think, meaning something like direction. So if something is isotropic, it means it comes equally from all directions. It's uniform. It's like featureless. And so anisotropy is the opposite. And it means uh, the map of the sky has bumps on it. So that's what we wanted to know and, and what we discovered. And then one last thing before we get into the findings is that you shared the Nobel Prize. I think you had one half. The other half was George Smoots of Berkeley. But my understanding is that he wasn't as directly involved in the entirety of the Kobe project in the way that you were. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but what was his role in the research? And Okay, the well, prize? Uh, yeah. so I was the project scientist for the whole mission and also the principal investigator for that spectrometer experiment we talked about. Uh, George was the principal investigator for the differential microwave radiometers. <clears throat> but of course, all of these things are teamwork. So most of that work for the radiometers was done at Goddard Space Flight Center, where our teams were. Yeah. Hmm. So one of you was searching for the isotropy and the other was searching for the anisotropy. Is that a rough division? No, uh, not quite, because the spectrum is a measurement of brightness versus wavelength. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and we were expecting it to be almost perfect, which it was. And the anisotropy is a comparison of one direction with another. So, it was a team project, so all of us worked on all of the instruments. So, I worked on the anisotropy question too, including uh, some of the very conceptual things at the very beginning and how to analyze the data. <clears throat> so, yeah, very much of a team project. Mm -hmm. So, there were a number of findings of the mission, uh, major findings. And first and foremost, I think your observation supported the hot Big Bang theory of the early universe. And can you reiterate again just why it supported this theory? Yeah, uh, basically... Um, the observation that the spectrum is perfectly in match with the prediction is is the is the clincher. Um, none of the competing theories could come anywhere close. Like so, what the are static. the competing theories? So, there was a static, uh, an idea that the universe was static. That was Einstein's. Well, that just couldn't be right. It was shown immediately that it wasn't uh, from observations, and also eventually Einstein saw that. Uh, even his idea was unstable. It could not have been static. So it wasn't static, but there was another one that was popular called the steady state, which is not exactly static, but it said the uh, age of the universe is infinity, and the way that we are see it is being, uh, it is expanding, and it's continually being replenished from some mysterious source of material. So that they... Um, it only looks like it has a finite age. It really has an infinite age. So the problem with that one was it could not reproduce the spectrum because in that story, the light does not come from the hot initial conditions where it's cooked to perfection. 
It comes from later processes of starlight uh, being absorbed by dust grains and then emitting far infrared light or microwave light. So they just never could match that theory to the observations. So the the hot Big Bang theory, just to reiterate and make sure that I have it right, it predicts that there is this early stage of the universe where everything is quite uniform, modulo, some some densities that result in the anisotropy of the CMB. And you would expect from your instrument to detect this uniform background microwave radiation if the hot Big Bang theory was correct. And that's what you found. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. What would one have expected for, say, the static universe? What sort of data would have supported that theory? Well, I think we should skip over that because, you know, it's in static. But if you mean the the, um, steady state theory, Mm -hmm. where it's the expanding but being replenished, then um, we should have seen a different spectrum. Uh, different dif- distribution of heat with wavelengths. And if you had seen something that looked like uh, uh, starlight re-radiated by dust grains, then that would have matched that story. Okay. I see. And then how does inflationary cosmology, so pioneered by Alan Guth, help to account for this really high degree of isotropy? That basically posits that the early universe was sort of static enough for a while for it to become uniform. Then it started to expand. And so you take a more or less uniform early universe and stretch it out, and it's even more uniform. So and that explains uh, several things. One is that we see the temperatures the same in two opposite directions, over there and over there. And you can't see my hand, but I mean, Mm -hmm. exactly opposite directions. How does the universe get set up so two places that are not in connection now could have been set up to be so uniform when they started? So we say, well, they were were close enough together to be the same when the universe was young, and then they got stretched apart uh, by this inflationary story. So we should probably say, what is the proposed idea that behind this so Alan Guth and his friends invented or suggested that there's certain quantum mechanical ideas that would do this. A, uh, you imagine a thing called a scalar field that has a certain properties, and then you say um, it's unstable. And then you say, in that case, it will lead to an expansion that uh, doubles in size about 100 times, at least, and that will stretch everything out a lot. And then when it's done doing that, then it will turn this energy of the unstable expansion into the particles that we see today, the quarks and gluons and protons and neutrons and electrons and all those things that we now have. So it's a hypothesis that's a quantum mechanical process of the early universe with a certain properties um, that cause the expansion and then produce the particles that we see today. Hmm. There are... There are a few other questions that I, I, they're not, I guess, directly related to the observations of the Kobe, but they're, they're related to the underlying phenomena. And when we train our most powerful telescopes, like maybe the Hubble or the Webb, to the edge of the observable universe, where we reach this sort of murky horizon of billions year old plasma is this the state of the universe that released what has become the cmb uh no we're not looking and with that we're not looking nearly far enough back okay um with uh web we can see the first galaxies growing at a one or two hundred maybe million years after the expansion uh, with the and then before that there was something we called the cosmic dark ages where there are no particular objects to find only the cosmic microwave radiation and some inner, some gaseous material out there that's not luminous because no stars have been formed yet. <clears throat> then before that is uh, what we call the, the cosmic decoupling. Uh, when the universe is about 400,000 years old, uh, the temperature is about 3,000 degrees Kelvin everywhere, and it's uh, high enough that 
uh, electrons and protons do not stick together. So the early universe is made of a plasma. And, and the plasma is opaque for, for electromagnetic radiation because the, the uh, electromagnetic radiation bounces off the electrons very quickly. So we're, that's as far as we can see back with getting an image. So when we see the cosmic microwave background radiation with its bumps on the map, anisotropy, that's the universe as it was when it was 400,000 years old, about. Um, in principle, there's more information, but you, have, you cannot see it that way. Right. Maybe gravitational waves, something else. Like yes, that. indeed. We are, that is the next big thing to go after. If the early universe had gravitational waves propagating in it, then they should have had an effect on the polarization of the spots that we see today. And so that's the big hunt. Mm. Where our, my f colleagues are busy working on that, and there are thousands of scientists trying to get that answer. Let me tell you a story about why this matters. Uh, um, what's, the, what's the material like in the earliest universe? Well, here as an example, uh, with air, uh, we have sound waves, and the sound waves are just compression waves, pressure waves. And um, But if I had a solid material, then I can also say I've got a stick. I can knock the stick sideways, and laterally propagating the sound waves will go through the wood also. So um, <clears throat> that means sound waves have three, di three directions of polarization in, in wood, in solids. In gases, there's only one direction of polarization, which is in the direction of motion of the wave. So now we want to know, well, what's the, what's the properties of the early universe? Does it support gravitational waves? Um, you know, sort of, well, how it's a, what's its elasticity like? So this is a way of getting at it. Hmm. So that's why it's important. Yes. Getting, yes. The, getting at the nature of the material back then. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, we've, we've discussed one of the main conclusions. That's the isotropy. So the data from Kobe confirmed that the universe is quite uniform. But now for the anisotropy, it's not perfectly uniform. uniform. What is the actual variability, the, the measurement? Okay. <clears throat> well, we observed about a part in 100,000 with the Kobe satellite. Now, if you get a little bit better angular resolution, which we got with subsequent equipment like the WMAP mission and the Planck mission, it's about 10 times more because on a scale of about one degree angular size, the spots are brighter. <clears throat> and so this is because of the details of how the universe became transparent at its time when it became a, uh, when it was 400,000 years old. So there were sound waves propagating at that time and making some spots brighter and some parts spots fainter. So the details are controlling that, and that's why we see that difference. So the <clears throat> the way that uh, scientists represent this is uh, what we call a, a spectrum of anisotropy. How bright are the fluctuations as a function of spatial size? And so um, when you get at that, you, uh, you make a plot, and the plot has, you would have think, well, it's about the same at all scales. But then it turns out it's not because of the details of the uh, of the events at decoupling. So there's a big peak at an angular scale of about one degree. And then there is several smaller peaks at smaller angular scales. So there are about six or seven little peaks that you can find if you really work at it. <clears throat> and if you really believe your story, then you should be able to fit. All the data should fit those seven little peaks exactly. Which is true. They do. Which is a totally astonishing accomplishment. So the variability itself is variable. Yes. Hmm. Variable variability. Yeah, second order variability, meta variability. Yep. But and there are so many spots on the map that you can get this very accurately. Hmm. And hmm. How do you maybe just answered this slightly, but how do theorists account for this variability since I mean the early configurations of the universe presumably had very low entropy? What resulted in the earliest inhomogeneities that show up in our observations of the CMB? Was it these sound waves that you were referring to? Yeah. So the picture is, uh, in this, if we start with this, um, 
Imagine that the inflation that we talked about just stretches things out over and over and over and over. Uh, it leads to a natural prediction that um, the original fluctuations in the early universe should be about the same brightness on every physical scale, small, medium, and large. And then we say, but we think we understand what happens when the universe goes transparent. And the uh, sm- large sound waves, large scale sound waves won't be much attenuated. The small scale ones will be because of astrophysical processes, how the gaseous stuff is moving around. <clears throat> so we start off with something that's smooth and has no bumps on it. And we say, okay, now we think we understand these equations. There should now be seven bumps. And so uh, then when you get a match, you say, now I think I really understand. The, what's left open is what made those bumps in the first place during the time of inflation. And that is unknowable at the moment. <clears throat> but there's one prediction <clears throat> that the inflation story makes, which is really quite remarkable. It says there's something called a, a spectrum pow- power loss spectrum, yeah, which says how how much are the the uh, fluctuations of small, medium, and large scales. And the number would have been about one if you were completely naive. And if and if you believe this inflation story, it should have been 0.97. And we measured, and it's 0.97, which is a shock to me. I thought we'd never get that to be ever true. When Alan Guth told us this story, ah, I thought you were just making that up for fun. And there would never be any provable anything about it. And now we have not exactly a proof, but it's pretty darn good. Hmm. You know, I there is another sort of conceptual question that I have here about the early universe being in a low entropy state, which I understand just based on the the second law of thermodynamics that it's going to be lower than it was than it is now. But most examples of high entropy states, they they correspond to instances of, of great macroscopic homogeneity because it's it's these states that admit of the greatest number of potential microstates that could result in the same macroscopic configuration. So that's why an omelet, which looks much more homogeneous than an egg, is you would just assume that it has higher entropy than the egg itself. Now, what is it about the the the, the apparent homogeneity of this early plasma notwithstanding the the density fluctuations that resulted in the CMBs and isotropy that made it such a low entropy state? Is part of it the fact that space is so much smaller and it's compressed? I understand that that would have an effect on the entropy or the heat or what what is going on. Yeah, so honestly, you don't really understand it. Okay. So I would better to ask Alan Guth and other people who do. Sure. Um, but... Uh, at least uh, uh, there seems to be no escape from the second law of thermodynamics. We go from lower entropy to higher entropy almost all the time and quite quickly because we're, the, we're talking about very large collections of objects. So <clears throat> basically you can't beat Mother Nature. So any theory you come up with that doesn't do that can't be right. Mm. So Right. I, I I seem to recall something I read. It might have to do with because of the high temperatures the the Higgs field <laughs> uh, behaved differently and things just weren't running into each other they didn't have mass I, but I don't know I guess that is maybe yeah, something I don't, that I, I don't understand that better ask somebody else <laughs> sure I'll ask um, Alan Guth or somebody else about it but hmm what sorts so after the data is collected, or maybe while it's being collected, what sorts of precautions were taken or what sorts of methods were used in the interpretation of the data to ensure that what you were measuring was indeed the CMB, given that all other, as you mentioned, all other sorts of bodies throughout the universe have emitted and continue to emit radiation in the same spectrum, like the Earth is extraordinarily close. And you already mentioned the shield there for that, but everywhere you look, Microwave radiation. Absolutely. 
Um, the way we sort of go at it is we use our imagination to say, well, what could go wrong? Yeah, we argue and think and, and toss ideas around um, for a long time. We make our lists and uh, then we say, well, if that were happening, well, how would you know? And what effect would that have on the data? And then you look at the data, does it show up? So oh, as an example, one thing that does show up, uh, we knew that our microwave receivers on the DMR instrument were susceptible to the Earth's magnetic field. Yeah, and we knew about that when we designed it. We couldn't present, could not completely prevent it. So now, what is it going to do to us? So, well, you yeah, you use your computer and you say, well, if it does that, then this is how it would look on the sky. So you have gigantic computer simulations with adjustable parameters about how do these little magnetic shields work and all those things that you might want to know. And then you say, does this match the reality? And uh, and if you adjust the uh, parameters that describe the magnetic shield as well as you can, can you make a model that fits perfectly? And then you say, yeah, that's pretty good. Let's subtract the model from the f observations and see what's left. So that's the number one thing we had to tackle was the Earth's magnetic field. Then some of the others are a little more subtle, like uh, does the Earth shine over the edge of the sunshade sometimes? Yes, it does. And so maybe the data that are taken on those days are not as good. So can you tell? So basically, every time you think you've got a problem, you may say, if that was true, what would it look like? Can I measure? Yeah. And so we spent a long, long time working on that question. And about six months between the first uh, pictures that we had that were made by Ned Wright at UCLA, uh, he did his own simplified uh, but accurate uh, computer calculation of the map. He just came to our science meeting. He showed us the pictures with the red and blue green spots. Oh, this is real, he says. And then we say, um, how would we know? So then we started our official process to do what I just described. Just think about all the things that could go wrong and test them. And of course, one thing that can go wrong is a person can make a mistake. So you have to do everything twice, at least. Well, now we've spoken about two of the three conclusions that I wanted to get to that came from Kobe. And the third, you you already mentioned this early in our conversation, but it was based, based on the interpretation of the data. The objects that developed after the Big Bang are twice as bright as was once believed. And I think you already said what sorts of objects these were, but how is it determined that they're they're twice as bright as they once were? And you said that we still don't understand it necessarily, but just what does it have? Just uh, what does it say about our understanding of the universe? Yeah, well, I think maybe by now uh, somebody perhaps does understand it, but I haven't seen the, the papers about it. Um, but the sort of presumption was that our extrapolation of the brightness of objects from what we can see with Hubble and, and telescopes that can see visible light to what do they do at infrared wavelengths was just not right. So if the universe is twice as bright as we thought, then it means half the starlight has been absorbed by dust grains and re-radiated at infrared wavelengths so that we didn't see them before. So that means early galaxies, current galaxies are dustier than people thought. So lots of interesting surprises about that. Now, getting into the details, that's where it gets exciting for astronomers. And maybe we finally have an answer now because the Hubble and the Webb together should have been able to see those classes of objects that are now supposed to add up to the right answer for the instrument on the COBE satellite. But I'm, I'm not sure. I should be checking, checking my mail to see has anybody finally answered this question? Hmm. Well, that about wraps up the Kobe, with the exception of what is the fate of the Kobe? Is it still up there? What's what's its future going to be? Yeah, its uh, future is uh, it's probably dead, <clears throat> not working anymore. <clears throat> it's lost a few pieces that we know of because they watch it with radar. So it has uh, plastic insulation on the outside, and some of them have flown off. Because of these space rocks, or just no, just uh, sheer uh, scotch tape gets old. Okay. 
Um, I don't know if it's scotch tape, but tape gets old. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's up there. It's pr probably tumbling randomly because the electronics probably not working anymore. Um, and it's uh, orbit is expecting to keep it up there about a thousand years. So coming back down to Earth sometime, but not while we're here. Hmm. Well, you mentioned earlier this other mission that investigated the CMB. And the one I have in mind is WMAP. So the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. And were you involved in this mission at all? A little. I'm I was sure working consult. with I, I was working with the team that proposed it uh, while early in the early phases <clears throat> between the end of the Kobe mission and the start of the Webb Telescope mission for me. That was what I was working on. But when I got a phone call from NASA headquarters, would you like to work on this new telescope? I dropped everything else. I said, I know where this is going. This is the best thing I could possibly work on. So mm -hmm. you're talking about James Webb. Yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, how I mean now. Beyond Kobe, there's other data. There's the W map. How has all of this collectively impacted our understanding of the age of the universe? Well, <clears throat> we now have an interesting challenge uh, because we have multiple ways of est estimating the expansion rate. Um, we have um, the traditional method of looking at the galaxies receding from us and trying to say how far away are they and get the distance versus the the rate. And that gets what we call the Hubble constant. And we have the other way, which has an uh, interpretation of the spots of the microwave map. And we are both quite sure, both methods are quite certain that they're right. Interesting fact is we don't agree between these two methods. So uh, when this first started up, I thought, well, we're just making a mistake with a measurement. But people have been pursuing this question now for a long time, and the measurements are getting better, and uh, the mistake has not been found. So that says maybe nature is telling us something interesting. Uh, so <clears throat> the big uncertainty is something we call cosmic dark energy. Yeah, right, and, right. Of course, we know about the acceleration of the universe, um, and we gave a Nobel Prize a few years back to the lads who discovered that. Um, and it was a big surprise. Reese, Reese, Martin, um, Adam uh, Reese, Adam Reese, and and two other guys. <clears throat> anyway, Adam was the guy who was first saw this. In fact, he was a, a postdoc at the time, really young fellow. But he discovered that uh, things did not add up. <clears throat> <clears throat> so um, anyway, so that we know the universe is accelerating, and it's pretty well described by a single number, uh, which we call the cosmological constant. But now, there's no particular reason to think the universe is simple. So maybe there's another kind of thing going on. Maybe this, uh, maybe the cos cosmological constant is not a constant. Uh, so that's the big question open for scientists now. And we have um, lots of new experiments that are going after it. European Space Agency just launched the Euclid mission, uh, specifically designed to go after the uh, evidence from galaxies about the expansion rate and the dark matter and the dark energy. Uh, NASA is working on the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, and it's specifically designed to do that. It's even more powerful. And plus, we've got all the calculations from the microwave background and all of the other things about galaxies and all of the wonderful surprises we're getting about the early galaxies with the web. So I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, my all, always my initial faith is we made a mistake, but we we can't just always say that. But we might just discover something interesting. Yeah, well, the, the history of science is the history of mistakes, but mistakes that move forward. I think is a, is, a, is a good way of explaining it. Well, the last sort of dimension of these cosmic microwave background experiments that I wanted to talk about before maybe we finish with some of your more recent work is what all of this tells us about the geometry of the universe, or the shape of space. Okay. <clears throat> the current evidence that I know of is that the universe is expanding and accelerating and that it's 
considered to be geometrically flat, which is a bit of a surprise. Um, Space-time in four dimensions is not flat. Uh, and that is because uh, gravity operates by curving space-time. But if you were to take a snapshot of the universe, say, the whole thing as it is now, now, 13.7 billion years after the expansion began, you had a three-dimensional map. And, and that's a map in which uh, triangles add up to 180 degrees. It's spatially flat. And uh, why would that be? Uh, one explanation is there's some law of nature that we don't know about that makes it so. Uh, one would be that um, this uh, cosmic expansion has stretched out the curvature so it's unmeasurably small. So that's uh, something in favor of the inflationary theory. We start something that is curved and it's not very curved anymore and we can't see it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And then it also could have been saddle shaped or... Who knows? There, there are a lot of options. I'm sure if you speak to string theorists, there are many more dimensions to be taking into. And if you go back into the earliest moments, you could imagine, then it probably wasn't flat, mm -hmm. spatially flat, but it is now. Mm -hmm. Well, we can close the chapter on Kobe and the CMB for now. Am I right that in the time since then, your primary focus has been on the James Webb? Yes, uh, I started in the uh, day after Halloween in 95, and we're coming up on that day now in uh, 2023, so 28 years about. So, yes, that's been pretty much all, everything I've done for that whole period of time. But I do have some other interests that I've been pursuing as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in something I'm now calling hybrid observatories. A hybrid observatory combines, a, say, a telescope in the ground and something else in space to make it work better. So that's say my more. current interest. How does that work? Because they're not tethered together. I, they're not work. tethered together. <laughs> so there are two ways they could work. One is you need them uh, functioning together, but they don't have to be specially aligned. So as an example, um, if we take the Event Horizon Telescope that measured the uh, uh, black hole profiles um, with uh, millimeter wave and observations, uh, that would work better if you had another antenna and you could have it orbiting around the Earth or you could have it on a balloon or somewhere else. As long as it was somewhere different, it could improve the data. So you'd, um, if you could do that, then you could actually measure the spins of black holes. And there's no other way to do that. So that's pretty exciting possibility. Definitely. So find a way to get a relatively small antenna into space and make it work with the uh, equipment we already have on the Event Horizon Telescope. Hmm. And that would be cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the least difficult one is to fly a calibrator object, a, a standard light bulb. Yeah, We do not actually know how bright the stars are when you come down to it, because we've never been able to compare them with a standard light bulb from the Bureau of Standards, or NIST now, it's called National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, because um, we've got the atmosphere in the way. We can put our standard light bulb here on Earth, and, but we have to look at a star through the air. So that a standard light bulb in space could help a lot. Could get a, we have several, we're probably within about 2 or 3% of the right answer, maybe better. Uh, but that's not good enough for some of the things we need to know. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a pretty simple thing that we ought to be doing now and some people are already working on that <clears throat> we could fly an orbiting guide star say an orbiting guide star could be used to improve adaptive optics on telescopes so we already have adaptive optics on the on telescopes and they compensate for the turbulent earth's atmosphere to get sharper images but they don't work well enough yet at visible wavelengths <clears throat> and one solution to that would be uh, fly, a, fly a star that can put you can put near the target as seen from your telescope so you have something to focus on and compensate for that turbulence. So that's uh, something we're we'll calling the orbiting configurable artificial star or orcus <laughs> like in the shark mm -hmm. uh, but not a shark sorry it's a killer whale, whale. Um, but anyway uh, that's one idea and it could help with Observations of uh, the first galaxies, uh, observations of uh, even the solar corona. Um, you can't see this corona of the sun very well, 
with a telescope because you have to see it through air from the ground and it's turbulent and you can't do adaptive optics on that. Um, they have adaptive optics working on the, on the solar photosphere. So you get marvelous pictures of the, the sunspots uh, already with a telescope in Hawaii. Uh, but how about seeing the corona, that hairy stuff that's a million degrees? That way we could do that. So these are some examples, um, the relatively easy ones. The hardest one I'm working on is called an orbiting starshade. If we could put a thing about 100 meters across in space and cast a shadow of a star onto a telescope on the ground uh, for long enough, we could get a picture of another star system with planets. And then in about a minute, we could get a picture of the planets. Oh, wow. So that's pretty spectacular. Yeah, it is. A minute. And the reason that's possible is... Uh, your friends in Europe are building a telescope that's 39 meters in diameter. Six times as big as the web. And it makes me jealous. <laughs> makes me jealous too. The, the idea though that you brought up that sticks out at me most is this standard light bulb idea. Because I know that as you were talking, I was like, what, what do you mean? We already have our standard candles in the form of this type of white dwarf. But then we're just that's already a star that we're using to compare other stars to. The point is that we can't hold that in our hands and check it out terrestrially. That's exactly right. And so, of course, we think we understand those stars pretty well. We have the computer simulations of their atmospheres with every possible known kind of physics that we put in. And you'd say that's pretty good. It is pretty good, uh, but it's not perfect. Hmm. Um, another project that you haven't mentioned or didn't mention that I read about that struck me that I thought was pretty cool was sending a telescope to the outer solar system, not just orbiting around Earth so that it's not dealing with, forget the planetary atmospheric perturbations, but some of the dust that's just in the inner solar system. Yeah, I did work on that idea a long time ago, and it was too hard. Uh, I so see. we stopped. You st um, because the the problem that would enter, answer is uh, how bright is that early universe? What is the was, was first galaxies doing? Um, <clears throat> but you need a fairly large telescope. You need to get it really far out. So uh, the best we have on that one at the moment was done by the New Horizons mission, which has a little telescope. It was not designed for this purpose, but they've done the best they can with it. So we have an estimate. Hmm. And then one telescope that I, I'm sure there are all sorts of projects going on, but I heard recently on Sean Carroll's Mindscape podcast, I don't recall who his guest was, but this idea of placing an absolutely massive telescope on the moon, uh, maybe on the dark side of the moon in one of the craters there, uh, because there you could just build something absolutely enormous. But I'm guessing that that's not something that is currently in the works. Well, it's not currently in the works. People have been very ingenious and creative about how you would do it, though. <clears throat> uh, to me, it's not a very attractive idea because really? it's uh, harder to put something on the surface of the moon than it is to put it in space. Right. It's a lot harder. Right. You have to lift it up from Earth, and you have to land it on the moon, well, and then you have to put it together. It yeah, yeah. And then you have to put it together, and then... Uh, there's gravity, which bends things. So, and every time you point your telescope in another direction, it bends the telescope differently. Then there's uh, dust. The surface of the moon is not clean. That way, when you see the astronauts go out with their boots on, they come back with dust all over them. It's really hard to get it off so they can even safely get back into their spaceship. So... Uh, it's actually a pretty rotten place to put a telescope of the kinds that people have historically talked about. On the other hand, it's a great place for a telescope that picks up uh, light at around a meter wavelength, that is to say radio, because it is the only place in the solar system that's dark. Uh, when, when it's the far side of the moon and also dark because it's uh, that phase of its orbit around the Earth, then... Um, the noise that comes from the sun and the noise that comes from the earth are both being blocked. And it is the quietest, quietest spot in the entire solar system at meter wavelengths. 
So when we get ready, that's the, that's the best place to go. Hmm. Well, John, the, the last thing I will ask, because this question, when I asked you about this self-improvement work you were doing in 74, I got a very interesting answer. I'm going to ask you a question in a, in a similar vein just to finish this off. But in your autobiography uh, for the Nobel Prize, you wrote that life is a team sport and it matters who's on the team and which team one chooses to be on. And you've been a part of a lot of teams. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on what that meant to you and has meant throughout your life and career. Yeah. So, of course, you don't really know what team you're on when you start. No. Um, when you're born, you say you're on their parents' team, you're in your community. And <clears throat> gradually, you begin to understand the world a little bit and say, well, that's pretty interesting over there. They're working on something. And then, I've, of course, there isn't anything I've done that, couldn't have, that could have been done without NASA. Um, NASA is a huge team. Uh, we're on that team uh, partly because world events required it. Uh, the Soviet Union threatened the United States uh, with their nuclear arsenal and uh, satellites flying overhead, and that got Congress to act and create NASA. <clears throat> so we are here in large part because we're on the uh, on that team, uh, and we now uh, have been able to accomplish amazing things because this team knows how to do things. Um, we have been here long enough to develop good practices and recruit amazing people. So I do not know how to manage a project, uh, but NASA does. We have people who have done it before. And so I am in awe of the people who managed our web telescope project. I'm in awe of the people who managed the Kobe satellite teams. Um, and of course, it's not just one person, it's many teams. We had 20,000 people working on the web telescope and we count them all up. And that means we had hundreds and thousands of managers who managed those teams over time. Mm -hmm. So we all had to get good at managing, uh, managing well enough. So because those people can do those things, then let's see what we can do next. Mm -hmm. All right. What a great way to end. John, thanks for doing this deep dive on Kobe and the cosmic microwave background with me. It was great, and I'm so grateful for your time. Well, thank you, Robinson. It's a pleasure talking with you, and I look forward to seeing what we make together. <laughs> so, thanks again. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Airhome.